Welcome back to Chaos Corner. It's me, it's me, it's the GOC, part three of Pro Wrestling Managing 101. We had the 15-minute opening monologue. We just went on to segment two, and here we are in segment segment three. And you know what's been a constant battle here today has been Alexa. For whatever reason, I've had Alexa on today to test it out because, of course, the wife and the family wanted to bring it into the house, not knowing that we have enough technical difficulties already. So that's what we're doing here on Chaos Corner from the lounge, live to tape, trying to cover the complete idiot's guide to pro wrestling from over 20 years ago, almost 25 years ago, with Burt Randolph Sugar and Captain Lou Albano, a match made in heaven, considering it's me too. But we've been interrupted on all three segments. Not only my main coon, the boy Emilio, Alexa, the book, the glasses. So different things are happening right now. As I just said, Alexa, and it went, and it went off. This happened to JD, who I moderate for and off the script. I mean, it was hilarious. So what did my family do? They decided to, in the lounge... Because we have the bunker, we have the executive boardroom, we have the office, we have the other spare rooms, and especially the bunker. But you want to set it up here? So fans, bear with me, the GOC. Uh, I, I am on my second coffee. I had a shot of an espresso, uh, but I am hydrating. It's we're coming up on the weekend. It's, it's the first weekend of December, and you're here with the GOC. So we're talking about pro wrestling managing and managing 101. So go back, uh, we're talking about Freddie Blassie, we're talking about Captain Lou Albano, we're in the middle of a story right now of Bruno San Martino and Ivan Koloff and Captain Lou from Madison Square Garden. So come on back, we're going to hop off all these other social media platforms, follow me on all of them, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you guys know the deal, right? Don't go anywhere, come on back. So we are here, we're, we didn't really go anywhere. We're back. Let, let me take a sip. Thanks for bearing with me and all the chicanery on the first couple of episodes. But check out the 15-minute monologue and then part one of this. This is part two. I guess we'll label this part two. I, I believe it's part two. It's been a lot of distractions. Uh, thank God it's empty here. But what a read. And, of course, I throw in my stories along with it. So we were in the story of... Uh, Captain Lou, again, quoting a lot of him, saying that, you know, he wasn't a very good uh, wrestler, so he was going to become a manager. And it was Bruno San Martino that came up that idea and had him approach Vince Sr. Alexa, lower the music. That's a little better. See what I have to contend with here? It's live to tape, reality TV, one man, unedited, no producer, no paywall. You guys see, right? Raw, unedited, unscripted. So here, here's where we were. Uh, you know, so Captain Lou became one of the most, uh, you know, acclaimed Hall of Fame managers ever. So we're going to throw in a couple of things here. Remember when this was written? Don't get your panties in a bunch. I went on television where I played it for all it was worth. We said this with tongue planted firmly in my safety pin cheek. And I'm repeating a little bit of the end. Uh, Bruno San Martino is Italian. I used to be an Italian, but I changed my name to Captain Lou Albert. Let's face it. What have guineas ever done? Here I decided to let it all hang out, as they say. All they've ever done is drive garbage trucks. I mean, you like take garbage trucks in New York and uh, you see an Italian driving a Puerto Rican loading. Uh, at midday, they switch off. Well, that tore it up. The hue and cry went out from all quarters. The young lords of Puerto Rican gang threatened to kill me. My goombas were, the only, were a little less than sense, but what the heck? It was only part of my job as manager to hype the match, or so I thought. And that's how it was back in the day, especially in the territories, whether it be down in the south, deep south, uh, even out west, Pacific Northwest, uh, Canada, and here in the northeast. I mean, especially ethnic-wise and ancestry. I mean, it really was the sport to behold. And then when TV was invented in the 50s, I mean... Think about how pro wrestling was. And then we can even go to current day. Uh, when I say current day, we'll say when I was in my 30s, when it was in the 90s here, and millions, 10, 9, uh, you know, million people watching uh, on, in one night. And now they they think if they get a million or two, it's, it's, it's a big deal, right? 
<laughs> you can't make it up, man. I mean, you really can't. So let that uh, uh, sit back and relax on the different things that you might want to talk about when it comes to uh, numbers and ratings of current day product. And you know, I cover it all. WWE, uh, AEW, MLW, the NWA, Ring of Honor, New Japan, Impact, uh, Lucha, uh, Independent, my home, of course, of Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling and the Paradise Four. So you guys know that I have my pulse on it. It's my over five decades as a fan, uh, a scout, a historian, a smart, a mark. That's right. I said it, a mark. And of course, my over three decades as a pro wrestling manager, commentator, broadcaster, interviewer. I mean, jack of all trades, master of done. I mean, I got to jerk off the dog to feed the duck. I mean, the, the cat. I'm, I'm confused as a baby at Hooters. I mean, you guys get that, right? Did I say you guys? So I hope you're here for all the different parts. And this is what you get when you come into my house, which is the bunker. Again, as I said, the different offices and place, and where I hang my hat. And you guys, this is what's different and unique about what I bring to you as a show and reality TV. And again, making it relatable. One man talking so we can understand and relate. So I hope you stay here for all of it and check out all these videos. So back onto the Captain Lou uh, story here once we got through all the... Uh, different terms that were used, uh, you know, running the hype, uh, you know, we'll call it modern madness wrestling today. That's basically what it is, right? That night at Madison Square Garden bout, that night of the very bout of Koloff and San Martino, I still didn't have a clue. I looked at the capacity house and thought, what a good manager am I? But Vince had other thoughts. We're going to have trouble. He kept saying, even Koloff seemed, uh, uh, and sensed maybe, mm, something told me not to get too close to him. They were both right. Almost as soon as Koloff pinned San Martino to win the belt, someone threw a firecracker from the balcony and went off with a resounding boom. That's right. Vince hollered to me, don't go into the ring. But uh, that was unnecessary. I had no intentions of doing so. I reverted back to my old shtick of running and running fast. Now remember, this is Captain Lou Albano talking here. Uh, fast, straight out of the garden, but not before everyone in the capacity crowd had thrown anything and everything they could and tried to lay hands on me. They were flower pots, beer cups, and all manner of other identifiable flybys. It was a wild scene, and my managerial hype had created it. That's what it was, was like back then, especially in the territory days and the golden era, which I guess was the first golden era. You want to put the 50s, right? You want to put the second golden era, the late 70s uh, into the late 80s would be the second golden era. Some say the original, but that would be the second golden era. The third golden era would be what? The Monday Night Wars and then throw in how ECW was created and what was happening through there and, and the millions of people was uh, uh, no matter what age you were watching the product those were really the three golden eras as we're here in December of 2022 nothing has really captured after the Monday Night Wars attitude era that era's what middle late 90s perhaps into the early 2000s it's been a, a good damn near tier two decades. Uh, I had a little hope for current WWE right now. And even in the mid 2000s, uh, there was some good stuff, uh, you know, even in the later, you know, 2015, 2017, but it was really changing. I'm not being old school, not being Jim Cornette, just giving you here what we're talking about here, according to the book. And this is what I throw in as my thoughts, but, uh, and I'm not bashing today's product because I'm still a fan and I cover it all, not because I'm getting paid. I mean, you guys know that. Hello? I'm doing this as a stress reliever for me and to entertain you guys and to document my own channel because everything's on here from my career to things I've done in movies and film and, and TV shows. And, and, you know, I still have so much more to come and, and look at the community page. And you know, we're just starting here. I, I have over three decades and I've only been doing this for solidly less than three years. So we'll, we'll continue. Let me, let me have a shot of the... There's still a little espresso residue in it. How funny has all this Alexa stuff been on? Let me not say it too loud. It happens to be right here. I am in the lounge, the big boy lounge. 
So let that, uh, uh, think about that, kick back and relax. And as you think about that, and as I wear the double shades, you see them, right? These are really unbelievable Oakleys that I had. And I've had since, let's say, middle 90s, late 90s, late 90s, I think. Long time I've had these, middle 90s. Nice, relaxed. All right, back to the task at hand. So that's what happened back in the day in the territories, whether it be the NWA, Mid-South, uh, you know, Georgia, Florida, or the Carolinas, which, you know, if you watch Tales from the Territories, even up here in the Northeast, I mean, people took this stuff crazy. I mean, uh, it really did. The fans were sold. K Fabe was alive. Uh, manager notes here, uh, Ted DiBiase. We're going we're gonna to hop right over that uh, because Ted DiBiase was mainly a wrestler, but different things that he did. Uh, wrestling managers often rank wrestlers and their managers. Ratings vary from publication to publication, but over time, the same names continue to show up on a list. Here are some of today's most popular managers. Now, remember, this is over 21, almost 25 years ago this book was written, late 90s. And I already said Freddie Blassie, and I already said the Grand Wizard, and Captain Lou Albano, and Paul Ellering, and Jimmy Hart, and Gary Hart, and you know guys that were wrestlers that became managers, whether it be guys like Paul Jones, and I mean the list goes on, you know, of, of different managers that I could think of. If I think about different days and different times uh, of managers that I want to talk about, but we'll go with the book here, as a, Alexa again is doing something off the hook, but. Thank God we're kicking back. Bill Alfonso, Paul Bearer, Jim Cornette, Paul E. Dangerously, now Paul Heyman, again, perhaps the greatest of all time. They mentioned Ted DiBiase because he was a manager for a while, but I look at DiBiase as a grappler, not a manager. Jimmy Hart. People forget Jose Lothario, but I look at Jose Lothario as a, as a pro res, a wrestler. Uh, people have said Clarence Mason, Sonny Ono, uh, Colonel Parker, you know, uh, Robert Fuller, Victor Quinones. I don't look at these. He was a promoter. Uh, Parker was a, a wrestler as well. Uh, Sonny Ono, okay. Mason, okay. Rick Rude, definitely not a manager. Sonny, okay, a.k.a. Tammy Lynn. Uh, Harvey Whippleman, uh, of course. Downtown Bruno, Hello. All the different guys that I've mentioned, and they don't even talk about James Mitchell, and they don't even uh, talk about other uh, different managers that I could think and go on. And as I ponder, there's a lot of current managers. Even today, I told you, uh, and I forgot his name earlier. It's the funniest thing in the monologue. If you go back when I was talking about Malcolm Bivens, uh, he's current today. Uh, you know, uh, Mark, smart Mark Sterling is current today. Paul Heyman is the man. These guys are managers, not managers, but Heyman, of course. And then you look back at the legendary managers, and I know I'm skipping out and missing a lot from Sir Oliver Humperdinck to just... I said Sir Oliver Humperdinck. <laughs> so, and all the different guys at King Curtis, Iokea. I mean, just look at different managers. We could sit here and go on forever and ever. But these... And remember the storyline and the timeline that how we're here... Uh, of what we're reading here, and a complete idiot's guide, a match made in heaven. Not all interviews go as planned. One time when I was on TV being interviewed by Vince McMahon Jr., I stood there yammering away and smoking a cigar, spilling ashes all over myself. I didn't know my shirt was made of polyester. Suddenly, Vince Jr. looked at me in horror and yelled, I looked down and saw my shirt was on fire. Burned my back and part of my arm, but what the heck, it added to the hype. To quote Captain Lou Albano. Let's move forward here. Chaos Corner. This is part three of this, or part two if you count the opening monologue. We'll then go one and two, but three parts all together. I saw a sanctuary in a nearby restaurant. As I ran, the bartender yelled, Captain Lou, you better get out of here. I saw a bunch of young guys, maybe 25 or so, staring menacingly in my direction. So I hollered, call the cops, and ran back out into the street to grab a cab. But as I got in, some of the young toughs started banging on the windows and the roof and rocking the cab. It reminds me of DC Cab, the movie with Mr. T, Gary Busey, and the Barbarian Twins. Irene Cara, I think, was in that movie. Rest in peace, Irene Cara. Uh, heading to... Uh, 
Heeding the driver's pleas to get out, I exited and ran back into the bar. The gang ultimately wrecked the joint, causing uh, $27,000 worth of damage. These are Captain Lou's stories and quotes from him while he was alive over you know, almost 25 years ago. So as I read the stories here, remember the timeline and what I'm bringing back to you here is as history and, to, and for content and to bring you guys something. And because I had the time impromptu. I've also done interviews that were different. Uh, did you hear the octave change there? Style altogether, funny and funnier. One of them was with my tag team partner, the Moon Dogs. They would come out on camera, eat raw meat like the Samoans, and then they'd let it all howl. Then I'd say something to announce to the announcer, like, "Watch it. We have to keep an eye on those Moon Dogs. If they start picking up their legs, you know what's happening. Like when a dog lifts its leg, <laughs> they'll do the same thing to you. So keep an eye on them. In other words." Gonna, somebody's going to take a piss on you. Another time I showed up on a set with a goldfish. I, I remember that. What do you want to say? Late, late 70s maybe? 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 The gimmick was that I'd hold it over one of the moon dogs and say, open up spot. Maybe the early 80s. And he'd howl, ow! And he'd usually get it into his mouth and then when the cameras went off, spit it out. But this time he actually swallowed it. He started screaming at me, totally out of character. And there went the gag. Now, these are stories that I'm reading here. So if it looks like I'm reading, it's, it's because I am kind of reading. You guys get that, right? And then I mix in my stories and my viewpoints and then whatever's going on here at Chaos Corner. Perpetual prankster. You know me, I never met a joke I didn't like, especially one I could pull on the announcers, the audience, or the wrestlers, including my own and uh, George the Animal Steel was the perfect straight man for such jokes. The animal was one of the weirdest wrestlers that I ever met. Never mind managed. Sometimes I thought he would have been as much at home in a zoo as in a ring. Let's go on to Bert's corner. Bert Randolph Sugar. Conflicts seen around the ring between managers or between managers and wrestlers are often the setup for an upcoming grudge. An upcoming grudge match as well. That has yet to be announced. So that's why you got to pay attention to the storytelling. And that's why the manager today, as it was back then, is current too. Especially most guys that can't talk or ones that even can. You have to have the distraction besides TNA and eye candy and the whole uh, intergender here thing. And I get it. And the Paradise is, Alley is even involved in it too. But what, what are we doing here? Can we keep it man versus man, woman versus women? You know, occasional valet gets involved. You give her a little pop, I guess. I'm just not into all that intergender tag team, mixed tag team. I get I get all that. But it, it really doesn't sell me. Like I watched Jordan Grace, great athlete, incredible, nothing against her. And, and MJF, you know, before he became MJF, maybe 2017, 2018. It just, it just didn't work a little too much. You know, uh, uh, Tessa Blanchard and Brian Cage. I also saw that. And, and then I've recently seen things here, even at the locally, in, you know, the Shadows of Titan Towers, locally in the independent scene. It just, for me, as an old school traditionalist and, and so on and so forth, I, I, I'm just telling you how I feel. I give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. You guys understand that, right? I don't want to get too too serious here. This is, you know, to parody and fun and entertainment and a, a stress reliever, but... You know, it's also a, a twist here, okay? So uh, back to George the Animal Steel and Captain Lou Albano. Anyway, we're both on Vince Jr.'s TV show, and I brought a third person, introduced as Dr. Ziff or some nonsense name, and then I added he's a psychiatrist and a gynecologist and, you know, someone who works both ends. If you've seen this, it's on YouTube. It's on the network. It's on the cock, uh, the peacock. Anyway, the doctor, really an, an actor, Set the animal down, and George utters one of his multi-syllabolic syllabilic grunts, drooling copelessly. The doctor peers at his head and says, It's a jungle in there. <laughs> then he decides that George needs shock treatments. If you guys remember the skit, this was funny for back then. I, I thought it was great. Even like Fuji Vice and so on and so forth, and being in a bar and that Funk's grill and... Go back and check that stuff out. Prime time and classic TV, in, in my opinion. That's what hooked me. Besides the, you know, the, the guys being larger than life and you know, in the ring. Simple. Keep it simple, stupid. 
Then he decides that George needs shock treatments and straps a metal helmet onto his head, hooks it up to some machine that looks like he came straight off the set of the movie Frankenstein, as I just said. He throws a switch and all of a sudden George bolts upright in his chair and starts speaking in pear shaped tongues. How now, brown cow? Of course. When the helmet came off, George reverted to the animal, which we know was a work anyway. George Steele, look at his shoot videos. What an incredible guy. Worked with him in the late 90s on a show here in the Constitution State. Unbelievable. I think I managed tough Tony DeVito from the Carnage crew that night. I, I believe I did. Tough Tony DeVito from the Carnage crew. Ring of Honor. You know, H.C. Loke. Uh, Tony DeVito. It was DeVito against Rough House Ralph Mosca, I believe. I'm trying to think if Psycho Sid was on that card or Tommy Rich. I mean, uh, Tommy Rogers. Definitely George the Animal Steel. And yes, I managed Tough Tony. Hmm. Different things I remember. I think that was 99, maybe. Uh, fans, uh, believed the hype of George the Animal there. Even hype like this, like that. I'll say that to say this. Later that same week, I was at Kennedy Airport about to board a plane for the next show. Suddenly, this woman comes up and hugs and kisses me and said, Captain Lou, Captain Lou, I want to thank you for saving and sending George Steele to the gynecologist and curing him. <laughs> I really, really need more than this. Captain Lou Albano. Now you know why I was hired and fired more times from Vince in the WWF uh, uh, than Billy Martin in the New York Yankees. Making the match, that's for sure. If the manager's first job is to hype the wrestlers, his second is to make the matches. By that I mean the manager suggests to the promoter who might make up the best drawing manage, uh, matches. Manager's note, Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart hails from Memphis, Tennessee. And has managed some great wrestlers. Among the wrestlers he's handled, you'll find such names as Hulk Hogan, Kevin Sullivan, Randy Savage, Lex Luger, and The Giant. He's also handled Brutus Beefcake, The Faces of Fear, King Kong Bundy, Greg Valentine, Earthquake, The Honky Tonk Man. I can go on and on. You guys get it? I guess I will. The Hart Foundation, Money Inc., and Dino Bravo. Under Hart's direction, Hogan became the WCW World Heavyweight Champion. His Heart Foundation and Money, Inc. won the tag team titles in WWF. Greg Valentine climbed to the top of the WWF with Heart leading the way. So did the Honky Tonk Man, right? And the Giant won the WCW World Championship title with Jimmy's help. Just little sidebars here from the book about certain managers, a legend in Jimmy Hart. You guys, I don't have to tell you this. I'm reading it from here. You guys can tell that, right? In your face, another sidebar comment here. A wrestler, especially baby face, has to remember that he's not just going up against the opponent listed on the card. He's probably going to have to take the baddies manager into account too. Bad guy wrestlers often work together with their managers to win any way they can with the manager distracting the ref or trying to disable the good guy. Simple stuff. Simple, simple stuff as I listen to a, a nationwide commercial because, again has been interrupted. It's, it's been Alexa the whole time, right? <laughs> it's just like in boxing. With match, which match will draw the most money? Would you put a, a Bruno San Martino in against the killer Kowalski? Yes, of course you would. Would you put a Bruno against Charlie Brown? No, like today's wrestling sometimes. I'm just saying. You're looking for something that will be very productive for your wrestler. Something that suits his talent. For your wrestler. Let me say it again. Take, for instance, the Iron Sheik. You want him in against somebody like Sergeant Slaughter so the U.S. goes up against Iran? Uh, that's a natural. Political, pushing the envelope, pushing the lines. Uh, we get it. Pitting good versus bad is always a crowd pleaser. Keep it simple, stupid, good versus evil. Because fans want somebody to lose, but not the hero. So good guy versus bad guy is always good. Good guy versus good guy is a problem. Sometimes you can't put a, you can put a killer Kowalski against another, maybe worse, villain and have a good outcome. I'm reading this. But normally the classic pair up is virtue over evil. As I stumbled there, refer to Bully Ray in the comments he said to me about, I don't know, 18 years ago. As we continue here in Chaos Corn, 25 minutes. 
So you go to the promoter and suggest a possible match. I remember when my tag team, the Wild Samoans, Peheaoi, Meli Hinikane, Pupule, Wiki Wiki, Mahalo, Aloha, came to me and suggested that I match Andre the Giant, one of my wrestlers, with a wrestler named the Junkyard Dog, the JYD. I brought the suggestion to Vince Sr., and it did well. Promoters do listen to the manager. If the manager has a record of coming up with good matchups, hello? Of course, when suggested matches, you're looking out for your guys. You cut the best deal for them you can get. That's part of the job. You know that, right? Then we go on to ringside antics. But we're 25 minutes. This is part opening monologue, part one, two. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Chaos Corner. I have to get more coffee. Live to tape. Pro Wrestling Managers. Idiot's Guide to Pro Wrestling. Who better than the GOC? That's me.